everyone. Welcome to tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room. Thank you all for coming. I'm Danielle Hicks. I am uh, from the Bonnie J. Adario Lung Cancer Foundation. My role there is to oversee patient programs and services. So anything that we do that has a direct impact on patients, whether it's support, education, navigation, that sort of thing, um, is my area of responsibility. I, of course, don't do that all by myself. We have a wonderful team of people um, uh, that I work with that, that do that with us. A couple of them are here tonight. We're happy to say this is our third year back in, um, in South Florida uh, with this wonderful team of doctors who come in and uh, agree to sit down and just have sort of a real conversation with you all about this disease, where we are, where we're going, and what it means to you. So, Okay, so um, as I said, this is about you guys, it's about the patients, and on purpose we don't have a lecture. You know, we don't want to bother you with the slides and more lectures. If this is an opportunity to share. Um, if you want to ask specific questions about topics that are or your interest from you or your family, and if not, we can talk a little bit about topics that are important for all of you. And, uh, but uh, please feel free to interrupt because uh, uh, it's about you, as I said. So, so you have questions or concerns. For example, uh, the lady was asking about stem cell therapy. So uh, why we don't do stem cell therapy for lung cancer yet? No, is it? Yeah, it's still. Uh, huh? No, it was still time. investigational uh, thing in in lung cancer. Um, uh, there was a paper um, last uh, year by. Paul Bond, Dr. Mina, um, Dr. Gazdar um, addressing the issue of stem cell in, in lung cancer. And we need to be very careful because uh, even though it seems to work you know, in different other diseases, it doesn't mean that it will work for, for, for lung cancer. So I think that we need to wait for uh, better studies you know, to uh, make an impact in what we are looking for, which is to improve the survival of our patient. Uh, and so I think that uh, in lung cancer, it is still ongoing. So we need to wait in that, in that sense. No, and also, for example, uh, stem cell therapy, you know, marrow transplant, basically what we do is we give a doses of chemo so high that we kill the cancer, but we kill the bone marrow. And then we rescue the patient, giving a bone marrow from itself, or for herself or himself that was storage, or a bone marrow from somebody else to rescue the patient so the patient don't die. But you know, that type of therapy is very raw. You know, it's very, how you say, hopefully primitive one day because you kill the whole body yeah. to do that. And then, of course, you rescue them. Hopefully, nowadays, with the new technologies that we have, we can find other ways to solve the problem. Even the people that does stem cell therapy now, <coughs> they do what they call CAR T cells. You know, these people with that treat leukemia and lymphoma, they now have, uh, they take your T cells they put it like a bomb in the engineering, and then they send it back to kill the cancer. So they don't have to kill the whole bone marrow. That's what we hope that we're we'll, gonna have to put you guys on that, uh, because now, thanks to immunotherapy, target therapy, we have other, other op options. Yeah, on CAR T, on CAR -T cell uh, studies are starting in, in other centers uh, for solid tumors. So, you know, as Dr. Reyes said, the uh, indication is for ALL. Uh, there are like two or three different companies that they are producing that. But now the, the, the time to move that into the solid tumor, solid tumor spa, uh, space, not only lung cancer, is already in place in the different universities and the program are going to start, or well, they already started. I have another question. Sir. Yes, are there any studies being funded now for official studies, formal studies for the stem cell therapy? Or is it just not funded because Big Pharma has no money in it? So that's my question. What happened is, as, as I was trying to tell you, uh, stem cell therapy uh, exists since the 1965, 70s. So we already, for example, have tried stem cell therapy for uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumors. We have tried stem cell therapy for testicular tumors, a lot of solid tumors. And as I said, because the approach is a little bit rough, you have to kill the tumor that and con, con, uh, cause considered damage to the patient. And then you have to practically resuscitate the patient. Hopefully, we don't have to pass to that route. You know, we can do maybe this process. For example, we give immunotherapy. We don't risk your life. Only three or five percent of you are risking their life because immunotherapy can cause damage. When we do stem cell therapy, maybe half of the patients may not survive. You know, that's why. Hopefully, we'll find other ways to fix this this disease without 
going that way. And that's why we have the, the other options, you know? Yeah, I think that's a very, um, I think that's a very exciting part of doing thoracic oncology now that um, we have learned that lung cancer are, are as diverse as the people here. So like some of you have cancers that are molecularly targeted, some are, have high mutation burdens, some are very sensitive to the immune system. And I think that um, we are now, instead of picking like one therapy for all patients, we can now do better by selecting therapies that you will do better with. So it's changing all the time, although we do have some challenges with KRAS. Immunotherapy has bypassed some of that mm -hmm. and has made it better. A question there? Yes. Um, I know that there must be an overlap between measuring different types of cancer, like adenocarcinoma and melanoma. And the treatments sometimes are reflective, one is the same as the other. For instance, Pembro is for both. Um, is a melanoma also affected by a PDL level? A yes. Yes, what happened is um, uh, we, we classify the tumors based on our science. Sure. But for example, 100 years ago, there were uh, liquid tumors and solid tumors. Mm -hmm. And then you have hematologists and oncologists. And today, we join together because cancer can be in the blood, can be in the, in the solid. At the end of the day, and then, and then we divide it by organs. You said cancer from the lung, cancer from the liver, et cetera. But at the end of the day, the cancer is not an organ. It's something molecular. It's something genetic. And so that's why, for example, uh, the reason why we join hematology and oncology is because, for example, there is a disease called uh, Burkitt lymphoma. Sometimes the disease likes to show up as a mass, and then in all times, oh, yeah, I call the oncologist. Sometimes the disease shows as a liquid, leukemia. It's the same disease, the same uh, genetic abnormality. So what matters at the end of the day is to shut down that bad gene. Doesn't matter if it's liquid, solid, whatever. And that's what was happening now. When we were trained, you know, we, I was trained as a lung cancer doctor. You know, we have the three of us, the five of us actually, because she's a radiation oncologist, she's a navigator, she's a surgeon. All of us are trained in aura. But for example, there is a drug that is going to be approved soon that we have, a, we use in memorial called larotrectinib. It's a drug that targets a genetic anormality called TREK, like Star Trek. That genetic anormality exists in lung cancer, colon cancer, sarcoma of the kids. So, and that genetic anormality causes different types of tumor. But when you shut down that gene, all of these cancers get cured. So that's why we are shifting the paradigm. You know, that's what Dr. Estelamari was talking about molecular diagnosis. In the future, maybe we will not be experts by organs, you know. We will dedicate ourselves to shut down all of these bad genes with genetic therapy. And that is what I'm doing. Some of you are taking pills that target specific genes. And our job is to try to develop more drugs to target more genes to kill more cancers, you know. Yeah. One short one. Regarding Pembro, is there any long-term statistics on survival rate? Uh -huh. with Pembro, with high PDL. I, I, I want to back a little bit for, I want to answer your question, but the PDL1 differs also from tumor to tumor because you mentioned lung and melanoma. Yes. Okay? In some tumor types, we don't check for PDL1. <laughs> melanoma is one of them. The PDL1 is irrelevant, also in head and neck, because those patients will respond to the immunotherapy. But there are some tumor types which are less immunogenic that they don't like to share the antigens to the immune system. And, and because of that, uh, at least in lung cancer, we depend on PDL1 and other biomarkers to see which patient will do well or not on immunotherapy. So there are two tumors that are very immunogenic. One is uh, melanoma, the other one is kidney cancer. Those, do, those are very well handled with other medications before we knew about the checkpoint inhibitor. Now, to answer your question about the Pembro, remember, nivolumab was the first drug approved uh, in USA and perhaps in the world, uh, no more than that. March 2015, okay, it's more than three years. But it takes time to see how long those patients will, will live. But what, what I can tell you is that in the latest, in the latest uh, clinical trial on first line, okay, first line, using pembrolizumab, which is Keytruda, uh, with chemotherapy in combination, you can see the, a big difference between the triplet, okay, using immunotherapy versus the chemotherapy. And at the end of the tail of survival, you can, you can start to see a, a plateau. Okay, and plateau means that seeing that no pe people are not dying, thank God. Okay, so, but I think it's too prematurely uh, still to, to see how much 
will be the overall survival at five years. I think that that data doesn't exist yet, okay? But it looks very encouraging, very encouraging, because this, uh, when you have a chance, you go to the, the internet and, and look for Keynote, Keynote 189. That's one of my favorite clinical trials, because uh, that, that clinical trial, basically, uh, you can, uh, every single patient that was placed on the triplet did well on overall survival, progression-free survival, and the response rate in comparison with the other one. So I think people ask me uh, in my clinic, like yesterday and today, like, will I have a chance to cure? When I have a stage four patient, I say, no. Now, I don't say no. I say, I don't know. That's my answer. Because I have a patient with a stage four in complete remission using immunotherapy alone. So I don't know. But we do know that most patients, like, you're, like you people here, like are living lung cancer like a chronic disease. And that is a, a whole change, you know, mo, most of, in the past it didn't, it didn't used to be like that. It, patients, some patients will never see a thoracic oncologist. They will be sent by their primary care doctors to hospice. And I hope that never happens in this day because we have better tools. So I think, yeah, when I answered that question, I, you know, I, had a, I have a young patient who got his cycle 67 of nivolumab yesterday. And, you know, he, he's going forward. I think someone mentioned it, you just keep going forward. And we're being, we're surprising, like our patients are being surprised that people are living longer. I want to comment something uh, that is kind of uh, from our end, from radiation oncology, very interested. It's just, as a radiation oncology, we're trained basically to treat locally, especially in these patients, only um, uh, when patient has pain or when the tumor do not respond, was rapidly growing or pathological fracture or post-obstructive pneumonia that was causing symptoms. And typically, basically, the patient continue immunotherapy, target therapy, or chemotherapy. But um, at some point, we notice two phenomena. One, that uh, if for some reason we treat in a subset of the patients at stage four, name it 15, 20% of them, that if we treat one of the lesions for whatever reason, palliative treatment, uh, the others start disappearing. So this is a phenomenon that we call the abscopal effect that uh, we are kind of now trying to exploit uh, and take advantage of that. Doesn't happen to absolutely everybody, but that's how radiation um, is now uh, showing that has some um, effect in the immune system, meaning it's like a kill the tumor, release the antigens into the system, into the micro um, environment of the tumor, and all these kind of uh, dendritic cells and T cells and everything get activated and go a distance and attack the other side of malignant tumors. So that's one thing. And second thing is uh, radiation also has been noticed in studies that were first uh, in animals, then uh, uh, phase one looking for toxicity, and then now phase two, phase three, um, that has a, a synergistic effect with the immunotherapy and the target therapy. Meaning if we can combine them, because it's easy to combine chemotherapy with radiation therapy for seven weeks. How often do you give the chemotherapy? Once a week, every three weeks, radiation Monday through Friday, 15 minutes every day for seven weeks, right? That's very easy to combine. But when you start thinking about radiation as a single treatment for um, a long lesion or three or five treatments, because that is, uh, in essence, the esterotactic or what we call the um, SBRT. Um, then we start thinking, okay, the immunotherapy is how often or how we're going to combine if we truly believe in these studies that we see nowadays with excellent results. Um, are we going to give the immunotherapy before and then the esterotactic and then the immuno? And what is the time frame? So those studies are now looking uh, not only, is, they are very specific, not only with certain, you know, for prostate, for lung, for breast, but mostly for lung. Um, they are looking at that, that interval of time, looking at uh, those, um, those proteins in blood that they know that they're uh, involved in the cascade of the apoptosis or the necrosis or the killing of the malignant cells to see when they are going up in blood meaning it could be 24 hours, 48 hours. The average in general um, has been noticed that it's minimal of four days. Um, and to see what is the perfect combination, immuno, esterotactic, and then more continue with the immuno. And what are the numbers of um, metastases that we are supposed to be treating with certain benefit for the patient? Obviously, if the patient comes multiple, multiple uh, metastases, we are not going to just start treating like a crazy, you know, like a everything, like a. Uh, one by one, 
but has been described in the literature that depending on the number of lesions, uh, we call it oligometastasis. Probably you have heard about that term, that is few metastases or limited number of metastases. We started with three, now we're in six. So we know now, for uh, based on studies phase two, phase three, uh, that if we treat aggressively, meaning aggressively treat it, treat it, don't wait for the pain, don't wait, just basically you're diagnosed, start with the immunotherapy, obviously the systemic therapy, and then refer the patient to radiation oncology for treat one by one. Um, up to six lesions uh, could be what we call uh, synchronous, meaning that they present all at the same time, or it could be metachronous, meaning that um, uh, in a more of a six months difference, you present with two, then six months later come. I call them a frequent flyer because as, uh, as they said, we have patients now 10 years um, that every six months or every year, they come with one or two new lesions. So we are going in, I think, in the right um, path, but just keep in mind that um, it's a process and even radiation oncologists that work in the community many times, they, they know the benefit of stereotactic, but they are not in the top of um, you know, this new data. And they may say, well, if the patient doesn't have pain, if the patient has no pathological fracture, there's no need for radiation, which is case by case again, um, not true. Okay, great. So we are going to take advantage now that we have Dr. Mark Block. Uh, he is our leader of the Thoracic Oncology Program Memorial Cancer Institute. Um, to introduce him and ask him to maybe uh, talk a little bit, we want to ch have a break from immunotherapy. So <laughs> while you, you think, well, so I want to ask him to talk about the most important thing. You realize that um, with all everything that we're saying, we cure maybe 15% or 20% of the cancers. But now we have the advantage to save a lot of people by screening. So Dr. Mark Bloch is a, a champion of screening. I want him to inform us a little bit about the importance of uh, lung cancer screening. As Dr. Reyes alluded to, uh, lung cancer screening is something that we are now actively trying to promote. Uh, you're all familiar with mammography of breast cancer screening, you know, colonoscopy for colon cancer screening, PSAs for prostate. Uh, and up until very recently, uh, we were frustrated in our attempts to try and detect lung cancer early. The challenge, of course, is that you need to be accurate. Um, you want to be able to pick up an early lung cancer and identify that patient and treat them, uh, but not wind up doing a lot of invasive tests with potential complications on people who do not have lung cancer. And uh, for years, we tried a variety of things, chest x-rays, sputum cytology, and so forth. And it wasn't really until the development of the CAT scan, which has such high resolution, uh, that we really had the promise of detecting lung cancers early. Uh, and there's been a lot of controversy until uh, the publication of this huge uh, NIH-sponsored trial several years ago, uh, the National Lung Screening Trial, which hopefully you're all familiar with that very clearly showed a benefit to lung cancer screening uh, in the very uh, important measure of lung cancer mortality. In fact, uh, I don't know how, what, how familiar you are with clinical trials, but when we design a clinical trial where we're randomizing patients between the two arms, uh, we do that because we believe the two arms are somewhat the same. Um, that's called equipoise. We don't have a bias uh, that one is better than the other. If we did, it would be unethical to randomize patients to those two arms. And so when we do these trials, we build in a committee that's supposed to review the data every so often to make sure that really things are still undecided and it's still ethical to continue to enroll patients in this trial. And that was done for the National Lung Screening Trial. And it got to the point where that committee reviewed the data and said, well, you know, we now see a big difference and it's time to stop the trial. So the trial was stopped early. And even though the trial was stopped early, they saw a decrease in death from lung cancer of 20%. Now, that's not an increase in detection of early lung cancers. That's not operating on more patients with early lung cancers. That's not disease-free survival of lung cancer. That's actual mortality rate from lung cancer, which is really the ultimate goal. We want to reduce the death rates from lung cancer. So there was a 20% reduction in a trial that was stopped early, which means that if you play that out, across large populations, you will probably see an even greater reduction. Lung cancer screening is a program, and that's because if you take all the patients considered at risk, and those are patients with a heavy smoking history or a history of cancer, and you do a CAT scan on them, half of them will have an, a nodule in their lung, 50%. 
but only 2% of them will actually have cancer, which means that the vast majority of nodules that we discover on a CAT scan in a patient at risk for lung cancer is not lung cancer. So we should not be recommending biopsies, recommending operations, recommending invasive tests that carry risk, potential complications, for the majority of patients who have a nodule picked up on their CAT scan. And that's why it's so important to have a program put together where you have a radiologists who are trained to read them, and we have a very specific scale. For those of you maybe who've had mammography, you may understand that the, the radiologist will read your mammogram with a different graded scale. So in lung cancer, we now have what's called the lung rads score, so the radiologist will score the scan based on degree of suspicion. Uh, and then that scan will be reviewed based on the particular findings about, well, this is something that is very low suspicion. We can follow you and get another scan in six months, or we can get another scan in one year, or this is high suspicion, you really should be seen by a lung cancer expert who can recommend you get a PET scan, or you get a biopsy, or you get surgery. And what I want to emphasize not only um, is that lung cancer screening works, it's effective, very effective, but that it's more than just having a CAT scan. Just having a CAT scan is not really a good screening tool. You have to have that scan within the context of a program that's designed to properly evaluate it so we get the most out of it. So now I want to take advantage to talk about a little bit of navigation. Can, can you explain the importance of navigation for our patients? Again, um, I would like to ask all of you, how many times have you wondered what's the next step to do after you have seen your, your oncologist? Um, or to ask um, to, if it's possible to speak with somebody about the anxiety that you have for the upcoming biopsy, or um, how can you get some help to start the treatment, the next treatment, as soon as possible? Or um, how can you find out about the side effects of the current treatment that you're taking? How can you report your side effects, whatever symptoms you have, in a timely manner? Or um, what are the services that are available at Memorial Cancer Institute, and how can you benefit from them? Or what are the clinical trials that are available for the type of cancer that you have? Or, you know, these are questions that we all can relate to, because many times patients come to us and they ask this kind of questions. And uh, I would like to emphasize um, for the patient navigation, the patient navigation in our role, our goal is pretty much to anticipate and recognize and address the barriers that you might have and encounter that for the timely diagnosis, for treatment, to help patients to attain a better transition from one treatment to another, or to improve the timeliness of starting this treatment. So we also provide educational support and function as a resource for you and for your uh, family as well, caregivers. As we mentioned, we have low-cost um, uh, screening tests for lung cancer. Periodically, we do have uh, resources for support groups. We have uh, uh, written material about uh, the type of cancer that you have or the molecular marker that you're interested in you know, that says in the pathology report that you might have, so, or liquid biopsies. So there are really few things that you might find out about from us. Um, another thing that's very important is that we reach out and we strengthen the communication with other uh, team of specialists, and we ensure they are aware about your particular needs for the pending tests and results. So let's say you have a biopsy or you have, I don't know, a PET, a PET scan and you feel like you, you need a, you know, a certain sedative before the test or you have an allergy, reach out to us so we can also discuss your needs with the patient, with a uh, team of specialists, okay? Also, um, as I mentioned, we have a lot of resources so uh, available for you. The bottom line is that we empower you, but we also want you to feel informed, prepared, and getting the, the, need, the support that you need. And um, our uh, team will actually help you one-on-one -on -one if you need to. Just reach out to us over the phone, and we can guide you through the process and help you achieve the best care and experience uh, at Memorial, because we obviously we are stronger together. So uh, I like to say 
progress uh, depends on activism. And all of the developments that we've talked about tonight, all of these terrific therapies uh, required funding. And the funding, you know, none of this was for free. And the funding is based on activism. And activism really depends on survivors. The challenge that we've had with progress in lung cancer is that it's such a deadly disease that until recently there have been very few survivors. Not only that, there's the stigma of cigarette smoking. And those two factors have really made it difficult to make progress with lung cancer. And so I'm hopeful that we are uh, attacking that on two fronts. First of all, I think we're overcoming a lot of the stigma associated with cigarette smoking. So survivors and people with lung cancer will feel less stigmatized if they come out and talk about their disease. And because of all the great therapies these doctors have, we now have more people surviving lung cancer. So not only do we have uh, the stigma fading away, but we also have more survivors. And hopefully the combination of those two will lead to more patients who feel more comfortable being activists because we can shout as much as we want and go to the NIH and, and tell them it's important, but they really don't listen unless the patients knock on their door and say, this is important, this is what we need. So I, I just want to leave you with that thought that progress depends on activism and activism depends on patience. <laughs>